Right. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Jim Wiley. I'm director of the MSC Strategic Studies programmes uh, and have been for literally 40 years. Uh, and I found the subject engaging and obviously fascinating. And uh, there's a changing horizon every few years when it comes to the actual application uh, of strategy. Obviously, there were the Cold War years and then the years of the 1990s, what some people call the holiday from history, when eh, not all that much, globally speaking, was going on. And then, of course, the years of this century eh, with 9-11, eh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, eh, the insurgencies eh, in the Middle East, the questions about Iran and nuclear weapons, and of course, the rise of China to keep us all very, very interested. Its strategy has a, a role in addressing all of, of these issues. And my purpose here, fairly efficiently over the next 20 or so minutes, is to introduce you to what strategy actually is. It's a term that's, that's often misused. It carries a certain degree of sex appeal. If you have a plan and you call it a strategy, then it sounds much more exciting. So we discover universities have grand strategies, cities have transport strategies, businesses have marketing strategies, but these are not really strategies, they're plans, they're plans. No one is trying to kill them as they implement them. And indeed the human costs hopefully are relatively low. It's not the case of the a life or death of nations which are at stake. So I hope immediately you see that strategy is something quite different. It has a different moral code, it usually involves different kinds of costs, and it obliges to policy makers to make the kind of decisions that routinely in life, if they're planning a bus route or building a new university a building, that normally they're not obliged to encounter. So strategy, the primary purpose of the strategy I'm going to talk about, which is fundamentally military strategy, is to address the security of states. Uh, whether we like it or not, international society is organised on a nation state basis. And these states periodically compete. Sometimes they may even find themselves in conflict. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that conflict, war, is perpetual, it's always with us. That's either actual war, eh, planning for war, or hopefully planning to avoid war. Now in the Western world, the advanced industrial societies, eh, we're in the fortunate position that it's rarely that we encounter war, but nonetheless, we've got to keep planning to avoid that war. Uh, unfortunately, in much of the rest of the world, conflict is all too common. So strategy. Strategy incorporates plans, but strategy is not a plan. Uh, organising a new bus route or where do you build a, uh, a building or what's the future educational direction of a university is a plan. It's not essentially a strategy. Okay, let's look at strategy. It's, it's, it's from the ancient Greek strategus, which means generalship. And strategy, as I say here, is a compound of stratus, army, and again, to lead, hence strategy. And indeed, for much of the past 2,000 years, until really the last two or 300 years, strategy was normally associated with generalship, with how is it best to fight battles. In the last 200 years or so, roughly since the French Revolution, since the Napoleonic Wars, strategy has come to mean something more than uh, fighting battles. It means hopefully avoiding battles, or if you have to fight battles, how do you best use these battles to achieve your national objectives? So in modern times, what is strategy? Strategy, according to the eminent thinker Colin Gray, is the use that is made of force and the threat of force for the ends of policy. Uh, or Hedley Bull, the late Professor Hedley Bull, the art or the science of shaping means so as to promote ends in any field of conflict. So what we're looking at here 
is that states, and it's normally states we're thinking about, I know there are non-state actors out there like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others, but by and large it's states we're looking at. States have capabilities. When it comes to strategy, normally it's military capabilities, air forces, fleets and large armies. But states also have objectives, they have interests. And the question is, how do you best deploy and use your capabilities to address the objectives? And strategy is the bridge. It's the bridge between capabilities and objectives. It's a kind of mechanism which translates your capabilities into your objectives, hopefully the achievement of your objectives. One may well have a very large Navy, Army and Air Force sitting in your ports and on your airfields and in your barracks of your country, but there is something a thousand, two thousand, four thousand miles away that you have to achieve. Having these capabilities isn't enough. You've got to figure out how you actually apply them to the objective or the interest that might be very far away and indeed normally in very, very difficult conditions and circumstances. So think of strategy as, as that way, that formula that you can translate your capabilities, normally, normally military, sometimes economic, increasingly these days economic. How can you use them best to achieve your ends? And there are always effective, ineffective, good ways, bad ways, etc., to use these capabilities. Now, as I've said already, strategy is not a plan, although it may comprise a number of plans. First of all, it is contested. And that contestation can often be quite brutal. 2000 years of human history attests to that. Countries may try to implement strategies to translate their capabilities into objectives, but there's usually someone or a collection of people trying to stop them doing it. And indeed, that may well lead to war and it, can, it may well lead to very high casualties and high economic cost. It, most plans do not encounter that kind of opposition. Also, it is dynamic. It is constantly changing. As soon as you enter a contest, the thoughts you had at the beginning about how best to defeat your opponent, hopefully at low cost, after you receive the first punch, you usually have to think again about your strategy and change it. So you, it has to be dynamic. And also, a good strategy is one that gets more out of the situation than the starting balance of power would suggest. Strategy is about actually enhancing your capabilities, enhancing the influence that you derive from these capabilities. The quote you see there is from Lawrence Friedman, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, another noted strategic thinker. A good example of getting more power out of the starting balance of power is May 1940, when Nazi Germany was, in, was contesting with France in the early years of World War II. The balance of power would suggest that France really ought to have won that battle that contest in May 1940, it had more tanks, it had more aircraft than Nazi Germany. But Nazi Germany got more out of their lesser number of tanks by actually outflanking France, by going through the Ardennes forests and mountains, which most people assumed were, uh, were impassable to tanks and ground troops. But the Nazi generals went through there, they outflanked the superior number of French forces and they won the Battle of France and then held on to France for the following four years. So they got more out of the starting balance of power because of their strategy. Another feature of strategy is that it does not conform to common sense expectations. There's a sense of paradox, a reality of paradox running through proper strategy. As Edward Lutwak, another very famous uh, thinker, you know, uh, stick Edward Lutwak into YouTube and you'll see lots of interesting presentations and talks by Ed Lutwak. As he says here, it is not ordered by any familiar straightforward causal logic. There's a paradoxical logic to strategy. There's the good road or the bad road choice. 
Now, normally, if you were wanting to go from city A to city B effectively and efficiently, you would look for the best road and you would drive down that road. If you wish to sell goods as part of your marketing strategy, or I would say marketing plan, you go down the straight road, the wide road, the efficient road. Right. If you're transporting passengers, that's where you go as well. However, if you're actually trying to deploy your military capabilities to defeat the enemy that is blocking the main wonderful road, what do you do? You don't head down the good road. What you do is take the rough, tough mountain road and outflank, outflank your enemy. And there's a logic to that, but it's a paradoxical logic. There is the famous Roman dictum, if you wish peace, prepare for war. And that captures the paradox at the heart of strategy, that you actually sometimes have to spend a lot of money on arms, but not to use them. You want to have an efficient, effective deterrent, having a large army, navy or air force, not to actually go and fight people, but to stop them attacking you. If you wish peace, prepare for war. And this cuts across much of the of the orthodox liberal uh, view of, for example, military spending and arms. Uh, there is a, a view out there, uh, quite common, that uh, the more arms that you have, the more chance there is of war. But as a good strategist would say, no, uh, if you have arms which at least balance your rival's arms, and they're as good as your rival's arms, and crucially, are deployed strategically eh, to sustain that balance against your rival, then there's more chance of keeping the peace than if you are weaker than your rival and they are tempted to attack you. So if you wish peace, prepare for war. Now, of course, the primary purpose eh, of strategy is national eh, 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 security. We do live in a, an international system of nation states it's sometimes slightly comforting, but delusional to think that we're all global citizens and that we care as much about each other as we do eh, about ourselves. Eh, we don't. Eh, it is indeed, one could argue, eh, ethical that our leaders who are elected by us and paid by us, eh, or we believe God appointed them on our behalf, it depends the kind of system you're in, but nonetheless, these leaders owe their primary loyalty to the people in their tribe, their nation state, their city state, eh, or whatever. They don't owe their primary loyalty to some other people eh, in some other city states, tribes, empires, or nation states in other parts of the international eh, system. So how do they best look after the core values of their people? How do they best defend them and their borders and indeed, how do they best defend uh, their prosperity? Prosperity. For these purposes, you need to have some idea about how to use your capabilities. Uh, just uh, stepping away from it and saying, oh, it's all rather wicked to think about wars or how best to procure weapons to avoid wars doesn't cut it. There's 2000 years of history there which demonstrate that if you don't think about strategy, then you end up in a pretty dire a situation. So you think about your national security. Now, national security is actually a condition. It's it's out there, sometimes tangible, because you can look out from your shores, some countries, and see the enemy there, or look across your borders or see the enemy. Or for example, if you're in the UK, you can sometimes, within eyesight, actually see a Russian aircraft patrolling out there in the North Sea, not so far off the coast of Aberdeen. Or if you're in the south coast of England, you can sometimes see the, the naval vessels of rivals or potential enemies sailing in the North Sea and through the English Channel. So sometimes it's tangible and sometimes it's not. It's just a, a, a dynamic set of conditions. There is a tendency often to think that when governments produce white papers, saying this is our national security strategy. Uh, that, that's it, that's the job done for the next five years. But of course it isn't. Uh, you may have a national security strategy announced every four or five years, but the following morning and every morning thereafter, 
there are people in the defence departments of most of most states uh, working away, looking at the changing circumstances day by day and adapting uh, the national security strategy to meet these conditions. So it's, it's, it's a condition, it's not just a frame set of policies that you can put to the side and then go away and not worry about it for the next five years. Uh, strategy does not allow you to do that, you must keep adapting how your capabilities are deployed, trained, equipped, etc. And of course, national security is relative. It's a relative concept. There's no such thing as absolute national security. Even the most powerful countries in the world they do not have absolute national security. It's a bit like the health services in various countries. You can spend every penny you've got in your health service. People will still get ill. They will still die. You've got to accept that, that is the harsh reality of life. And the same with national security. There will always be vulnerabilities, but vulnerabilities are greater vis-a-vis -vis some actors than they are vis-a-vis -vis some other actors. So, for instance, UK national security vis-a-vis -vis Norway is exceedingly high, but UK national security vis-a-vis -vis the Russian Federation is considerably lower than that. US national security vis-a-vis -vis Canada is as near to 100% as one can possibly imagine. But US national security vis-a-vis -vis Iran, North Korea, China, the Russian Federation is considerably lower. And of course, when considering what your strategies should be, you have to take all that into account. So as I say here, eh, to be effective, strategies which address national security must be dynamic and they must be dynamic relative to a whole set of circumstances and actors actually out there. Eh, Murray and Grimsley, two well-known eh, scholars of strategy, argue that strategy is a process. It's a constant adaptation to shifting conditions and circumstances in a world where chance, uncertainty and ambiguity dominate. And let me stress this chance, uncertainty and ambiguity. Again, it, there's a certain degree of uncertainty and chance in all human activities, but the degree of ambiguity, chance and uncertainty in planning national security, in devising a strategy, exceeds, exceeds hugely that in trying to plan a transport system or how do you best market your soap powder or how do you best sell your frozen peas. It's, it's a, a different world altogether. As I've said already, if you get it wrong, the costs can be tremendous. They can be abs absolutely awful, exceeding anything that, for example, COVID could possibly threaten. Uh, Charles de Gaulle, General de Gaulle, President de Gaulle, you have to be fast on your feet and adaptive or else a strategy is useless. And the famous British general, Lord Kitchener, famous uh, war minister, we wage war not as we like, but as we must. In other words, just because you're uncomfortable with your country's strategy, just because you don't like the thought of nuclear weapons perhaps someday being used to punish somebody that has attacked you, doesn't mean that you don't have them. You wage war or indeed you threaten war, not as you would like, but as you have to. And indeed the famous American Civil War General, General Sherman, any attempt to make war safe and easy will result in humiliation and defeat. You know, it's a tough business is implementing strategy. And if you want to implement a safe, cuddly, attractive strategy, then the odds are that you're not facing up to the harsh realities out there and you will be defeated, which could have terrible consequences for your society. Yeah. Now, I've been talking generally so far about strategy. Let me suggest to you there are actually two pillars to strategy. There's the timeless pillar, which is the theory. And I put theory in inverted commas here. This is not scientific theory. It's not like physics or chemistry. We're talking about guidelines for behavior, principles of behavior when I say theory. And then there's doctrine. 
which is actually how theory is adapted to prevailing circumstances, to these moving circumstances and conditions I've just been talking about. Now, deterrence essentially has been with us for 2000 years throughout recorded history. What you are saying to somebody is, if you transgress against me, I will inflict pain on you, pain which outweighs the value of anything you can achieve. That's been there for 2000 years, that concept. In the last 50 or 60 years, it has been investigated, articulated and written about to a degree never seen before, largely because of the presence of nuclear weapons and nuclear missiles. Limited war as well, deliberately limiting the amount of war you wage against an enemy because the objectives are not total, they are limited. Again, that's been there and practiced for for centuries. But again, in modern times, eh, we find that limited war theory or principles have been written about, investigated, eh, more or less eh, in an effort, in an effort to be completely predictive. We're not quite there, but eh, getting there. And likewise, balance of power, alliance theories. They are all timeless. They are all there. They are there to be utilized. It's a bit like a golf bag with lots of clubs in it depending upon the lie of the fairway or how far you are from the green, you will select certain golf clubs to use. Now, these golf clubs are never changing. They're all the same. I'm not a golfer, but I gather that's the case. A number seven iron or a number eight or a number nine, they're always the same, whether it's now or 100 years ago or 50 years time. But you use them to address the particular circumstances. And that is doctrine. So during the Cold War, for example, the Western democracies had two doctrines. The one in Europe was flexible response. You borrowed from deterrence, you borrowed from limited war, you created this doctrine of flexible response. In the event of a Soviet bloc attack on West Europe, you wouldn't immediately devastate Russia with nuclear weapons. You would meet the level that they attacked you with, with similar force. You would meet force level with force level, that is the limited war, and at the same time say to them, you really shouldn't have done that. If you advance any further, then we will need to introduce a higher level of force. So the combination of deterrence and limited war delivered flexible response. At the global level, looking at the communist bloc in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, Soviet Union, communist China, what what was decided was that balance of power and alliance theory would be utilized to contain the communist bloc, not to roll it back because of nuclear weapons that might have brought devastating war, but you contained it where it was. Hence, you have the US-Japanese alliance, the US-South Korean alliance, you have the US-Australian-New Zealand alliance, and you have, of course, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization alliance in West Europe and the North Atlantic area. And that was all balancing the communist powers block by way of building alliances around it. So strategic theory, strategic theory, it is about how the application of force, usually military, will produce likely outcomes. So that's the theory bit. If you behave in a certain way, there's more chance of likely outcomes. In deterrence, for example, unless you have the correct weapons, unless you communicate your threat to the enemy and make them clear that you will punish them if they transgress. And indeed, they've also got to be, believe you, you must have credibility. With these three components, you have more chance of successfully deterring an enemy than if you are weak in these three components. So that's the kind of theory we're talking about. Also, the second point here, it's not normative, it's not value laden. It, just because you are a good guy, because you think God's on your side, doesn't mean that you will win. If the bad guy's strategy is better than yours, he will win. So there's no, non, there's no inherent normative superiority here. And indeed, you're, we're trying to construct this body of laws, this secular body of laws. A bit like chemistry or physics, if you put certain bits of chemicals together, you will get an explosion or you will produce something that helps the grass to grow and will always do so thereafter, whether you are a wicked country that's doing it or a virtuous country doing it. 
But let me warn you that uh, the bottom point, the bottom bullet point here, there are variables. Uh, we're talking about human behaviour here, the quality of your generals, your leadership. Uh, these all come into play, the quality of your weaponry, uh, the quality of the public support. All of this stuff comes into play and it's very difficult to quantify it. Hence, we may call it strategic theory. We may say it's timeless. We may say it helps to predict whether you succeed or not, but it cannot guarantee it. A strategic doctrine, this is you know, using the theories to deliver strategy for particular purposes in particular situations. What this does is it helps you, if something does happen, to avoid having to sit down with a blank sheet of paper and say, how do we begin to use our theories to address this? You've got the doctrine there. You can, you can begin with the doctrine. No doubt you may need to adapt it, but it stops every event being a special case. It also, very importantly, it aids in the choice of technology. There's a supermarket of wonderful weaponry out there. Now, if your doctrine is defensive, it helps you to decide what to buy. If it's offensive, it helps you to decide what to buy. So it helps you in that choice of technology. And also it projects your foreign policy goals. If you have an offensive a strategic doctrine, you're buying weaponry, which allows you to project power to distant parts of the world, then obviously that is the kind of foreign policy you have. You might have a foreign policy of liberal intervention, of spreading democracy, of opposing some vile ideology somewhere. A, a, a doctrine has got to link in a, with these foreign policy goals. A, the doctrine must be the right doctrine. You know, if not, your diplomacy will be paralysed. There's no point in having an offensive doctrine if your if your foreign policy and diplomacy is defensive. On, and the other way around, there's no point in having a defensive doctrine if your diplomacy is offensive. In 1938, Britain and France really couldn't do very much to save Czechoslovakia from Nazi Germany, eh, despite our very large forces, because these very large forces had a defensive doctrine, not an offensive doctrine. We could not project adequate power into Central Europe. Also, the doctrine must win public support. The public must be able to look at it and say, well, that makes sense. And we're willing to spend our taxes on that and we'll vote for these people that have that doctrine. If the public don't support it, then the doctrine will not work. Also, it should win the support of allies. If you want to maintain the cohesion of an alliance, you cannot have an offensive doctrine if you're part of a defensive alliance. And finally, it should not be too complicated because you know, when crises come along, uh, things get very tense. You don't want a doctrine that people perhaps cannot quite understand. Indeed, even the leaderships, the military and the political, eh, perhaps are stressed out. You don't want it too complicated. Eh, now, often it's quite unclear what countries' doctrines are. They may produce a document every four or five years. If in doubt, yes, look at the public declarations, but also look at their military exercises. And most important of all, look at what they are buying for their military. I'll finish in a couple of minutes. I know I'm slightly over time here. Military power is the primary instrument of strategy. Again, there seems to be a liberal democratic consensus that it should always be the last resort, whereas actually it's always the pervasive resort. It's always there. It makes credible all other sources of influence. The, the, the modern voguish notion of soft power is a deception if it's not backed up by a state's willingness, either up front or in the background, to use force when required. It just quickly, soft power, Joseph Nye famously introduced this notion of soft power 20, 25 years ago, that somehow culture, ideas, values, civil technology, if your society impresses the rest of the world, then actually maybe you don't need as much hard power. And people often associate it with diplomacy because it sounds nice. Hard power sounds tough, right? And often it seemed to be the opposite of diplomacy. Whereas actually, this is a misnomer. Diplomacy and military force are a false dichotomy. 
can more or less all negotiation, there is a military framework. But if country A does find itself pushing country B in negotiations too much, country B can always bring the generals into the room. The generals are there all the time down the corridor and in most routine diplomacy, they don't appear. But if things get tough, then you can bring them in. Even if your capabilities are not enough to defeat your negotiating rival, you can still inflict pain. You can still inflict a cost. And that is very important. Frederick the Great famously said, negotiations without arms are like music without instruments. Here we are, a, a quick gallop through what is strategy and how it addresses a, a national security. But let me stress, even though we talk about strategic theory, just like we talk about social science, I would argue it's not really a science. We're not quite there yet. As 2000 years of history demonstrates right from Alexander the Great through Napoleon, Wellington and right up to the great generals of modern times, such as Montgomery, the great leaders of modern times, such as Roosevelt and Eisenhower and, and Churchill, of course, uh, there's a skill, there's a human skill involved in this. Uh, it's an art. It's an art with scientific elements, but it's not a science. OK, thank you very much for your attention for that 30 minutes or so. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to have some questions. Thank you very much for that, that talk, Jim. There's a couple of questions came in uh, as you were speaking. Uh, first one uh, asks, uh, how do you think Brexit will change UK strategy and EU strategy? Well, if we're considering strategy as national security strategy, the primary vehicle for British national security strategy in the European and North Atlantic theatre is, of course, not the EU. The primary vehicle is the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. And indeed, most of the members of the EU recognise the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation as their primary vehicle for national security. So I don't see a, on the grand level British national security changing all that much. We'll carry on as very good and very committed members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, which is an, an intergovernmental organisation, unlike the EU, which is supranational. You know, so we're all independent members of NATO, and while we do our best to, to make sure our military forces work together, we do not integrate these forces. And this is the great attraction of, you know, of military alliances. And indeed, one can relatively easily leave NATO if one chooses. No country has so far because NATO delivers excellent value. And over and above from NATO, there's also other bilateral relationships. There is the Anglo-French Defence Treaty from 2010, which will last for 50 years, and that delivers considerable cooperation. We don't hear much about it between France and the UK. So yes, you know, uh, feathers were ruffled. Uh, politically, people fell out a bit over the UK leaving essentially the single market because that's what the EU fundamentally is. It's a single market uh, with aspirations, yes, in the defence field, which have not gone very far. The EU does have rudimentary security forces. They're not integrated. Uh, the EU would like them to be, but some countries stall at that. The UK used to stall, but even countries like, like France may talk the talk, but they don't particularly want to integrate their forces fully with Germany, for example, or Italy. Nonetheless, some of these forces are sent in very small packages to do police policing or peacekeeping in Central Africa or such places, and usually are only doing it for a very short period of time. So the EU is not a major security actor in practice, and British national security it will carry on on the being based largely on, on the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Grant, um, there was another question um, just asking about some of the careers that students uh -huh. uh, go on to from strategic studies programs. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> okay, thanks. Hey, well, there's a, what I've found over many decades is that many employers are attracted uh, by strategic studies. Uh, knowing how the world works really works, uh, especially when there's some kind of conflict, which might not necessarily be military conflict, but when there's competition, is very attractive to lots of employers. Uh, having that insight, uh, knowing where to go immediately to find out about what's happening somewhere in the world and being able to interpret it fairly quickly. You know, there are lots of wonderful uh, people out there with tremendous degrees in sciences or languages or literature. But if you said to them, you know, write me a thousand word report on the, on the security situation in that Filipino island where my company wants to invest $30 million in a gas plant, they would not know where to begin. But a strategic studies graduate would, and they could produce a good report in fairly short order. Now, governments like that, so there's all branches of government, whatever national government is yours, will have a foreign office research department, a defence research department. It will have, of course, the intelligence services and many, what I'm mentioning now, there are many past strategic studies graduates in the, in the defence ministries of the UK, Canada, Australia, the USA, Germany, France, Italy, India, many African countries, also in the intelligence services of these countries, in the armed forces of these countries. Also in many of the police forces, big city police forces, have their own intelligence sections. And if you're not actually an operational officer, which many past graduates are, then you're there in the research side of things. And of course, big cities have their counter-terrorism units. If you're in London, there's diplomatic protection. Increasingly these days, even in things like uh, customs and revenue, uh, units in these organisations work hand in glove with the police forces, they, they work hand in glove with the intelligence services uh, because they're countering illegal narcotics, illegal immigration, uh, counterfeit goods. Uh, so the many past graduates that they would go off they would think into a fairly routine humdrum career in customs and excise and suddenly find themselves because people notice their strategic studies degree as part of a unit working with uh, MI5, MI6 and some of the top police forces in the country uh, coping with, as I've just said, uh, illegal immigration, counter illegal narcotics, counter uh, counterfeit uh, goods uh, and indeed terrorism uh, per se. Then, of course, there's the large banks. The large banks have risk assessment units. And again, lots of our people are working for many of the big international banks in risk assessment units. Uh, again, you know, if someone's going to invest a lot of money in, in a troubled part of the world, then they want to know what's happening there. Uh, in that Filipino island that I mentioned a few minutes ago, they would want to know, uh, is there a history of kid kidnapping in the, in the area? If workers are sent there with families, is it secure for the families? Is the local authority corrupt? Are there terrorists in the region? What's the track record there? Is the central government stable? Is there a dispute between central government and local government? All that kind of stuff has to be figured out. And if banks are investing lots of money, they want to know. If private companies are, they want to know. Uh, big companies like the big oil companies, for example, BP, Shell, etc. Uh, if they don't have their own uh, people in-house, uh, and usually they have, then they contract out uh, to big management consultancies, PA consulting, for example. Uh, what we normally think of as the big uh, accountancy firms like Ernst & Young, they are increasingly moving into risk assessment. Uh, big insurance companies, now, I say insurance and people might think, oh, my goodness, you know, how boring insuring houses and motor cars. When a super tanker leaves the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz heading for Rotterdam with tens of millions of dollars worth of oil on board, it has to be insured. And there's a different insurance rate for every kilometre it travels. So coming out through the Strait of Hormuz, very high insurance rate, going past the Horn of Africa, high insurance rate, up through the past the West Africa, high insurance rate, into the English Channel, lower insurance rate. There's a different insurance rate for just about every kilometre and the big insurance companies in the City of London and in Wall Street 
meet people that know what's happening in these different parts of the world. If there's a truck going from Munich to Uzbekistan carrying high value kit, it has to be insured every mile of the way and that will change mile by mile as it goes through the Balkans, as it goes through Turkey, as it goes through the Caucasus, as it goes through Azerbaijan and Armenia, where there's a lot of conflict right now, it needs to be insured. So there's a whole range in government, in business. There are some bona fide eh, private security companies out there. One's got to be careful, there are some blue chip ones and there are some not so blue chip ones. But the blue chip ones, there's lots of careers there. Eh, I, these blue chip ones may well have ex-soldiers doing doing stuff on the ground, protecting pipelines in Iraq or protecting embassies in Afghanistan, but they've also got a big research eh, department eh, as well, most of them. You know, outfits like Control Risk in London, AKE in London, Aegis in London, Diligence in London, and usually they've got eh, branches also in Washington, Singapore, eh, even Hong Kong. Eh, and these are the private risk assessment and private security companies. Uh, there's one I know well, AKE, which uh, I've done little bits of work for, uh, which uh, for many years there uh, had the, the security contract uh, to provide security for British Airways, for Shell, for Human Rights Watch and for the BBC. Uh, so whenever the BBC would send a bunch of journalists off to Iraq or Afghanistan, they would be trained by AKE in what to do if they thought they were at risk. AKE will have safe houses in Kabul they can go to if they think they're being pursued, if they do get kidnapped, what to do. And indeed, there's a big research branch there as well. And small governments and big companies will give contracts to companies like AKE and, and Control Risks and many others that I mentioned there. And then, of course, there's also the media. There's jobs in the media. One can think, obviously, in foreign affairs reporting. And uh, uh, there's jobs in education uh, as as well. Uh, these degrees equip people to go and teach in the schools and colleges and uh, the universities in in uh, government or history or politics uh, or international affairs, international studies, and so on. Thank you very much. Um, that appears to be it for the questions that uh -huh. are coming in. Um, but if people want to get in touch, if people come up with questions later or just want to talk to you uh, a little bit more about our MSc programmes or anything, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, well, the best way to, is, is to just email me. Uh, if they go to the University of Aberdeen website uh, and just either stick in my name, James Wiley, uh, or go to the Department of Politics and International Relations, they will find me there and they will find uh, my email and I'm very happy uh, to have to have lots of questions. Uh, let me let me stress that uh, there's, there is the Strategic Studies MSc degree programme, but there's also Strategic Studies and Management where we select a couple of the uh, better modules of the MBA, you know, the module, for example, on negotiation skills. Uh, and we incorporate that uh, alongside strategic studies to give an MSc in strategic studies and, and management. And an another module from the MBA is on leadership. And again, one can imagine how that uh, fits well uh, with, with strategic studies. Then there's also the MSc strategic studies and energy security, uh, where we consider the nature of the energy world out there, which of course has a huge impact on national and international security. Uh, so strategic studies and energy security, and there's also strategic studies and international law, uh, the laws of armed conflict, for example. Uh, we look at that as well as looking at uh, strategic studies, global security, and, and so on. So there's an attractive package there. Uh, there there's, a, there, there's a common thread running through these degrees in that all of them do my strategic theory and most people in these degrees do my second semester global security. And I look after the summer dissertations of everyone in all these programmes. So I am there as the spine, the consistent spine running from September to the following September. Or if people start in January and we have January admissions, 
running from January to the following January, then I am there as the, the spine that runs through the constant point of contact <coughs> that uh, people have regarding these programmes. 